Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Sheradden. I direct the Center for Social Development at Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome to the Engaging Social Workers and Students in the, in the 2024 Elections. As you know, we're in a very busy and important election season. So this seminar and webinar is very timely. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with really excellent colleagues. Um, the Center for Social Development is partnering with the National Association of Social Workers, the Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement at Washington University, which takes provides campus leadership in this, in this area for voting um, and voting activity by students. The Nancy A. Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work and the Grand Challenges of Social Work and the Congressional Research Institute for Social Policy and, um, and, and, voting, is, and voting is Social Work. These are, these are excellent colleagues and, and it's been a team effort to put this, uh, put this program together. I'm delighted to be here uh, to help, to help uh, introduce. Uh, so let me say a couple, just a few minutes about social workers and, and elections. And then I'm going to take a minute to introduce uh, the memory of Gina Gunn McClendon, who was our colleague who passed away last year and, and did important work in this area. So social workers, let, let me just frame this by saying that social workers have a long history uh, on the front lines of democracy, playing major roles in, in women's suffrage movements in the early part of the 20th century and in, in, in voting rights and civil rights legislation in the, in the 1960s especially, along with many other engagements in, in voting and democracy. Um, this, this, is, this is about democracy work and access to voting. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's about a very large idea. It's not about politics and partisan politics uh, and about, about who's running for office or what their views are. It's about whether the whole society participates in that, in that political activity, that the voting activity. Some people try to frame this as a partisan issue by, by saying, but these are the people who somehow seem to think that not everyone should be able to vote. Um, but the, the, point of, the point that's being offered in this webinar and that social workers hold is that we will have a stronger country when everybody has a voice and everybody can express themselves and have a vote and have that vote counted. And as you know, we live in a period, unfortunately, when some of those issues are on the table. So this, this webinar is about freedom and participation and building a stronger society and a stronger world. In that spirit, um, allow me to take a minute to, to remember Gina Gunn McClendon. Gina was the Director of Community Engagement at the Center for Social Development. She was the, the founding director of the Voter Access and Engagement Initiative. And she also uh, did other, other, many other things at the center as, as all of us do. A work, she has did important work in financial capability and asset building. Gina passed away in, on October 21, uh, 2003, about a year ago. Um, she, she, um, she was very important in CSD's turning to voting access and engagement as a, as a topic because we, Working at working at polling stations in, in as volunteers, CSD staff noticed in in 2016 that a, that in the community we were in, it was a, a mostly black community in North St. Louis. Uh, not everyone was getting to vote. The voting places would not open up on time. There were sometimes not enough equipment. Uh, some and people had jobs. They they were in a long line. Have to go back. Have to go to work. Um, and Barack Obama lost Missouri in that year by. 3,000 votes. And, and the, what we witnessed that day was a good portion of 3,000 votes didn't vote right where we were because they had to leave. They had to go some, they had, they had child responsibilities, they had jobs, uh, low income people have to get to work or else they might lose their job. Um, so we, we then planned a study, a very systematic study of, of access to voting in, 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 in the Missouri metropolitan area. And to cut a long story short, we discovered that documented very, very carefully that indeed communities with more black people and communities with more poor people uh, face obstacles in voting. The voting, the voting stations, the, the process of voting doesn't work as well. 
So this is really another form of voter suppression. It's structured. It, that, it, it's happening. It's not even that some people are planning for it to happen. It just works that way. And that is the nature of structural racism. And, and we, we watched this happen and we documented and published a very nice article in Social Service Review. This is, this is Gina Dunn McClendon's leadership. She makes this important contribution and many others for us. She, was, she received a number of awards. I don't have time to, to list them all here, um, but she was quoted, um, and, I'll, and, I, and we'll leave you with these words. She was quoted a few years before she dies. She says, I don't want the world in this situation. People fought for me and I need to fight to make sure everyone can vote. So in that spirit, uh, we're, we're having this discussion today in Gina's name. I'm gonna hand off now to uh, my, my longtime colleague, Mimi Abramovitz, who's the Bertha Kappen Reynolds Professor Emerita at, uh, at, uh, Hunter, at Hunter University. And um, she's, she has been working in this area for a long time as well. And Mimi has some very wise things to say on this topic, Mimi. Well, thank you, Michael. Now I'm gonna uh, share my screen. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> Can every whoops? Nope, gotta stop it. I thought I had it all set up. Let me just try again. And sorry about that. My worst, my worst fantasy come true. <laughs> my worst horror show. Okay, let me try it again. Can you see it, folks? Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Michael, uh, for those important words and also for remembering Gina, who was also a board, an active board member on the uh, Voting and Social Works uh, Steering Committee. So I'm Mimi Abramovitz. I'm the co-chair of Voting and Social Work. And in that role for years, I rather assumed that our democracy was okay, like many of us did. Unfortunately, Today, we know that the US was not a well-functioning democracy before the capital insurrection. insurrection. So I'm gonna say a few words to help cap, um, sort of contextualize our discussion today. Um, history has revealed, as Michael just mentioned, a, a troubling pattern from, from reconstruction for the 1965 Voting Rights Act to the election of the first black president in 2008 each victory threatened white supremacy, male privilege, and class power, and led to an intense backlash. Today is not much different, but now we further understand what marginalized groups have always known, especially those subjected to government-sanctioned disenfranchisement. They have always known that we cannot take the right to vote or democracy itself for granted. So first came the vote. With easy access to unchecked dark money, the opponents of democracy have already, already installed legal structures to block the vote. And as Michael mentioned, voter suppression, overriding election results, voter intimidation, election deniers, and gerrymandering. Now, blocking the vote is not just, you know, a thing. It's intentionally designed to lower voter turnout, to silence the preferences of marginalized groups and to allow a, a small number of people with an outsized vote to install their anti-democratic, if not authoritarian, agenda and otherwise achieve their own ends. And, or but, it's not just a vote. The other guardrails of democracy have also been broken. Um, as you probably know, democracy's opponents know that exposure to new ideas and an informed citizenry strengthen democracy. So following the authoritarian playbook, they are what I call dumbing down the electorate. So they're banning books. Nearly half the states have introduced or passed laws to ban more than 4,000 titles on any topic that might make students uncomfortable, up 65% from a year ago. And they target marginalized ver uh, voices and controversial topics. The press is less independent. The number of independent newspapers has fallen by half since 1970. Most replaced by corporate owned media. Today, only 45% of Americans trust the news media to report fairly. 
those hostile to democracy have also changed how public education, including higher education, is taught, funded, and regulated. States now outlaw critical race theory, gender studies, and DEI programs. Project 2025, the infamous Project 2025, promises to abolish the Department of Education altogether. And finally, the Supreme Court has lost its way. Once believed to protect our basic rights, the current Supreme Court regularly overrides the will of the people of the majority in the favor of the top 1%. Today, only 25% Americans express confidence in the court, which is amazing. The loss of these democratic rights does not result from a single cataclysmic event. No, it's more like death from a thousand cuts. In isolation, each incremental erosion of a democratic institution often feels inconsequential. You may not even notice it or hear about it, but the ongoing impact is cumulative. And whoever wins the, this, the upcoming election, many of the anti-democratic structures are already in place. They're already in place and will be difficult to reverse. So we've lost trust in our democracy. In 1960, three quarters of Americans trusted the federal government, always or most of the time. Today, it's down to 20%. Two thirds of the world's population live under an authoritarian leader, which is kind of mind boggling and frightening, up 48% from 10 years ago. I think we now know that American democracy has always been a work in progress. But not since the American Civil War has there been so much concern that it is under serious threat. The good news is, the good news is, and I'm happy to say, we have a flourishing pro-democracy pro movement. At least 44 states have considered many bills and 23 states have passed them to expand the vote in 1924, to expand the vote. Our country is strong, we know, when voters pick their leaders not when leaders pick and choose their voters. And I say we cannot rest until every voter has equal access to the ballot and actually votes. So what can social workers do? We can and must up our game to strengthen the democratic institutions. Why? Well, we're in the right place. Every day we bear witness to and address the harms brought by a faltering democracy. We are well positioned to bring civic participation into the classroom, voter registration in the, to the practicum, and human rights into the US, United States. As you know, a mobilized citizenry is democracy's best defense. So imagine if all 700,000 US social workers registered three voters, and they registered three more voters, and so on. Guess what? There's no need to imagine. Join the voting as social work power of three campaign voter and um, the, and go, you can access this through our voting as social work for this information and for more and for more resources. You can speak out if not now, when. Thank you. And now speaking of pro democracy leaders, I am delighted to introduce Y T Bell, the Georgia State. Oh, let me. Stop this. The Georgia State Director of Southern Poverty Law Center. For over a decade, YT has worked as a social worker and public policy professional to strengthen democracy, combat hate, and eradicate poverty. She has held many top leadership positions with progressive advocacy organizations, including, and I still vote, care and action of the, Democrat, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the Progressive Governance Academy and Georgia Engage, Now America Votes Georgia. Her wealth of experience includes community organizing, strategic planning, leadership development, program implementation, and always fighting for victories for the people. As a native Georgian with master's degree in social work and public administration, YT also serves the Clarkson, Georgia City Council and the National Committee of Nominations and Leadership Identification for our very own NASW. Please welcome YT Bell. 
Thank you, Mimi, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm super delighted to be uh, with you in this space to meet this moment today, um, because there is no time like the present in order for us to be educated and activate and actually understand the power that we hold and create so much impact. And give me one second here as I turn on. All right, so we'll start here with this slide. So you are the answer to saving our democracy. And so we're gonna talk about stricter democracy and how we can educate ourselves, but also educate the people that care mostly about us, our friends, our neighbors, our classmates, if you're in school, and then get everybody activated. And so how I wanna start this because I'm in a safe space, I believe with lots of like-minded individuals, um, and social workers like myself, um, because that's at the core of who I am, and kind of frankly has gotten me into these other space of strategy, um, doing lobbying, uh, writing pieces of legislation. And I want to say that social workers are the stewards to the movement. And so we don't oftentimes talk about this in the social work space, but social workers actually help move a lots of landmark legislation. I'll give you an example. The Civil Rights Act of 1964. So most individuals don't know that social workers were the architect in the background to ensuring that this legislation was drafted and for it to be effective. Most people think that this bill um, that was signed by President Johnson um, was all about um, making segregation illegal. And that is true. However, it was also about ensuring equity for all. And that is what, you know, social workers at the core of what we're trying to illustrate is that everybody should have access. Everybody deserves a second chance. Everybody deserves access to transportation, adequate wages, also food and health care and options. And so that is essentially what social workers went in from being the architect of that piece of legislation, which is landmark, which we don't talk about enough. So as a result of that, I am telling you that information because I want you to see yourself in this movement, right? You're not just a voter. You're not just a social worker. You're not just a student. If that if those titles um, resonate with you, you are, you are a steward um, in this movement. And so I'll say here, going to this next side, is that vote your values. You hear and see this a lot. So what does that mean, right? That means hey, you know, democracy requires all us to vote. But there are other um, things that we want to think through because sometimes as you look at the ballot, you're not sure of who to vote for based off of what you care about, right? And so, and it's harder to have conversations with folks when you're talking about people rather than values. And so I'll give you an example of this. So my values are equity. As I mentioned, most social workers do value equity. And I value equity because I want everybody to have access to all the things that they need. So as a result of that, my issues are healthcare, education, because I see it from an equity lens. So when folks say vote my values, when my values be core of it is equity and all these other issues around it will be how I associate with who I vote for down the ballot. And I know, you know, at this time of the year, most people are talking about the top of the ticket. However, there are tons of statewide seats as well as local elections that impact your everyday life. If you are so upset about, um, potholes being in the road, that is a local um, decision that is made to pave it, um, to invest more in the infrastructure. So when you vote your values, I don't want you to vote your values just at the top of the ticket, but I want you to go all down the ballot because every position has the ability to govern and make decisions that will impact your, your quality of life. And so I want all of us to see ourselves in this movement, first and foremost, but I also want to ensure that we're voting our values because we understand the power that we hold. Yes, it's your voice, but remember, you are a trusted messenger. So if I went and talked to your friends and family members, I likely could not get them to do something. But if you told them why this, this is important to you and it's important to your nieces, nephews, family members, and cousins, and just for the future of our country, there is a strong likelihood that you could motivate and influence them a lot better than me, right? And so with understanding your power, you also have to understand the landscape and where we are. And so sometimes we don't talk about the wins, but that's important, right? To keep you motivated. Um, because there's a lot of stuff out here that is depleting us and quite frankly, causing us to feel like, hey, well, why would it matter if we participated or not? And so what I have here is just a regional glance of historical wins and losses. And so, you know, in the Midwest, we saw big wins in the last couple of cycles where we 
were able to help in coalition with partners pass some of the most progressive legislation that offer automatic voter registration and allow pre-registrations for individuals 16 and 17 years old. So that's getting them in the civic engagement movement a lot earlier so they understand their places and they're the best messengers for their friends who are turning 18 to make sure that they show up to the ballot and they vote down the ballot because they know what's at stake. But then the real reality is in the Southwestern and the Western part of the state, we saw things that would have a very harmful impact that were passed, like ballot imaging bill. This bill essentially um, would require a public visual of each other's ballot. Well, that's problematic for a number of reasons as it relates to individuals' privacy, but think about it from a social work lens. If you have a client potentially that wants to participate in both, but they know that you have this law that requires um, a public visual ballot which has their demographic information, their address and other information, that could be putting them in harm's way, right? And so that will be a likelihood that that individual doesn't want to participate. And those are some of the bills that we are constantly fighting uh, against. And quite frankly, that bill got defeated Um but there are bills like that that are showing up across the country. And then, quite frankly, even in states like Florida, in the last couple of cycles, due to like a lot of efforts around restricting access to the ballot because they know what's at stake. And the census told us 10 years ago who was going to be the new American majority, but also who, how potentially they vote, right? And so as a way of stopping and restricting their access to the ballot, what happened? They purged over a million registered voters from the polls in the last couple of years in Florida. Now, there have been concerted efforts by activists and organizers in Florida that have gotten a lot of those people back on the roll, but that is a ton of folks. Think about um, Michael's remark at the top of this webinar where he mentioned that, you know, didn't lose, Obama lost um, a, a city by a small vote margin. And so if you moved a million folks that were just registered, then that could have a significant impact on the outcome of that election. Even in Georgia, most recently, um, I'm from born and raised in Georgia, um, but um, the the election board essentially created some rules 90 days before election. We know that we're less than 60 days out now, but 90 days creating new rules can have significant impact, especially when it will overwhelm staff capacity, which is already limited currently because of legislation, as well as lack the certification. Now, that's the big one because we had delayed certification in previous election and these um these changes in the Board of Elections allow the electors, the, the board members, to have lots of power to stop counting and to stop the certification of the election, which could, quite frankly, impact who wins, right? And so that is just an overview of the landscape, just to know, just to make sure that you're fully educated on what we're up against, but also some of the victories that have been historical and that will change access to the ballot. But we know that across the South and across the West, we're definitely still in that fight in order to prioritize to ensure that folks can actually participate. And so this is just trends and patterns and significant restrictions. And if you can see here, it kind of goes over what I just laid out around where we're seeing less access, which is in Georgia, New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Wisconsin. If you've been watching the news, those are also places where people know that based off the census data and the demographic shifts and changes there, that could shift and change the state legislature, some of the city council races, some of the county electorate races, and quite frankly, that position at the top of the ticket. And there have been so many of them. Um, and so you're also seeing where there has been more, more access. And so in Nevada, and in Michigan, we've seen great, great tribes to make sure that everybody has access to the ballot and they're thinking about it from an equitable landscape. Now, if you're constantly attempting to, to, to take your voice away, understand that it is very powerful, right? As I keep mentioning, the census data told us 10 years ago, who was gonna be the new American majority? That is individuals of color and even more specific, the new American electorate that can change the outcome of this election are individuals 18 to 35 years old. And we know that a lot of our cities are trending younger and they make up the majority. So they know or individuals have an assumption that if those individuals turn out, it could change how what governance looks like in the majority of the states around the country. So 
We must educate, we must engage, and we must activate now. We don't wait until election day. There's so many things that have to be done before even you can vote, even if you can vote early in your state or on election day. And I'll list a few of those things. So we got into the activate. I've educated you on the landscape. I told you the importance of engagement and how social workers have been engaged for decades, for centuries. Uh, and they played a background role in a lot of the civil rights movements that you've seen or that you've heard about or read about in, histor in history books. Now, the activation, right? Most people say, hey, so I go vote. Well, there's more than you can do than just vote. We want you to vote for sure, but we also want to help um, find your role in your space, but also bring other people along. And so the first thing that I always encourage individuals to do is relational organizing. So what does that mean exactly? Well, that means that the people that you see in the classroom, the people that you see at the grocery store, you know, they're going to be there. You're going to be there even if it's at the gym, right? Those are the people that you have influence from because guess what? They trust you to a certain degree. They know that you're very consistent. They see you regularly and they're trying to receive more information each and every day about what's going on in the world. And so the news anchor or the radio journalist may not have an impact, but if you are talking to them about what's at stake and you talk about it from a value an issue-based lens of what you care about and how you're thinking about the future and not just today, you can have a distinct change. So my suggestion to you is you find three, four, five friends, neighbors to say, hey, this is why I vote. And I'll give you an example of how that could be rolled out. I always tell people that I vote for my friends that cannot vote. And what I mean by that is I have a lot of, of form-born uh, individuals that are friends of mine um, that cannot vote. However, they still pay taxes. When you go to the grocery store or when you go to the gas station, they don't ask them for their ID or citizenship. And so when I vote, I make sure that I'm voting for people that also, despite them not being able to cast the ballot, that their needs are going to be met by those individuals. The other thing you can do, is canvas. You don't have to canvas, you know, several thousands of doors, which we we would love for you to do. However, we want to make sure that it's feasible for where you are, but you can canvas your neighbors. They know where you live, especially if you've lived there in an apartment or a house for years, and you're a trusted messenger. So telling them, hey, don't, as a reminder, make a plan to vote can be very impactful, and you can see the impact of you your activation in real time by following up with them saying hey where's your sticker or how was it going to vote or even if you want to create a whole text thread of why you should vote or when you should vote or where the lines are to folks in your community that will help motivate them and remind them to turn out the vote the other thing that you can do is you can make a, a outing so say for instance you go to the movies every friday at 7 p.m well Right before you go to the movies, you say, hey, we're going to carpool this week. And so everybody get in the car at 630. Okay. So the movies, surprisingly, there is a voting booth. You find a voting booth, you go out and you say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and vote. There's The lines are short. And that is an outing, essentially, where you have motivated the people that are going to the movies with you to take a stop, to vote their values, and then go in fellowship at the movies. And it's just that simple. The other thing is you can share your story. You have no idea how much your story could resonate with somebody else in order to get them to turn out to vote, even if they felt like their vote didn't matter, right? When I talk about housing uh, affordability, when I talk about rent control, and I say, hey, these individuals have a track record where they prioritized it, and I went to a session, and they talked about all the things that they could do, that made a difference for some folks on who they were going to vote for, because that person, as a, as a core, housing was an issue that they cared about. And then... Finally, the other thing that you can do is become a poll worker. We know that we saw shortages right after COVID um, and those shortages still exist across the country. And so those are extremely large gaps of folks that we just need help. And the real reality is people don't talk about it as much, but you get paid to be a poll worker. And then also there's tons of election protection spaces across the country where we need more monitors to make sure that everybody is treated fairly, everybody has access to the ballot, and there are no discriminatory tactics that are occurring or harmful or threatening tactics that are happening at the polling location 
or you can help make sure that we're educating more people. And I put my email address on this slide, um, which will be shared with you. I know I saw some things in the chat box, but it will be shared with you. But that's another way that you can activate uh, in real time. And so this is just an overview of how at SPLC, um, where I lead the Georgia State Office, how we think about the work. Like at the core of it is people. Same model as what we care about as social workers. And so we have an organizing team and a strategy team that sits around it. And so we are of the community, in the community, with the community, not on behalf. And that is how we are able to organize them and help them understand their power and, and support them scale and use the tools that we have in order to take back their communities. And now I will pass it to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was, YT, that was a really excellent presentation with lots of wonderful detail about social work engagement and opportunities for uh, participating in the electoral process. We turn next to Tanya Rhodes Smith, director of the Nancy A. Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work at the University of Connecticut. Tanya has been working in this uh, field for quite a long time and has quite a lot to say. Tanya. Hi, thank you. And I hope to have half of the energy that YT had, but I am so excited um, to be with you here today. And I'm just gonna share my screen and okay. So I um, hope to continue the conversation that Dr. Abramovitz and um, YT started and talk about voting as a social work intervention. And what I wanna say today is that a little bit about the campaign voting as social work. Um, Dr. Abramovitz mentioned it um, along with her and Dr. Mizrahi, I'm a co-chair of the voting as social work campaign and we are working to integrate nonpartisan voter registration, education, and outreach into social work education and practice, because we really do see that power of social work to be transformative. We reach voters that are least likely to vote and be included in, in democracy or be invited into democracy. So two things on this slide. One, I'm going to be sharing. We have an all new website and resources at votingasocialwork.org. I'll be going very quickly today through my slides but all of it is available on voting as social work and we'll share the slides. And just to note that we're endorsed by more than 20 professional social work organizations. So really this is built into our code of ethics um, and, and all social workers should be engaging people to vote as part of their practice, whether they are working directly with individuals or whether they're working in, in organizations or even changing policy. Voting is an essential part of change and um, and bringing a better society to the people that a society that reflects our values and the people we serve. So a couple of points. There's many more, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why voting matters to social work's mission and impact. The first point I want to make is that voting is good for people. Communities and individuals or vote are better off and important in numerous numerous measures of well-being. So we know that voting is associated associated with higher earnings, um, more years of education, and higher rates of health and mental health, stronger connections within communities, and in young people, voting not only has been shown to correlate with with education and earnings, but also less risky behaviors in young people. And in formerly incarcerated, it's it's a significant that practice of voting correlates significantly with lower rates of recidivism. You know, be, voting is being part of your community, and so it's a really important aspect of citizenship, and 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 it tells something about somebody's relationship to their community, um, whether or not they're invited. And being a non-voter is incredibly isolating, and I'll hopefully touch on that for a second. But voting also, one other way to look and see how voting measures or benefits communities, when we look at the ease of access, as YT was talking about the ease of access to voting and plotted against um, health, this website is fantastic. It's on our website, um, it, but we can see this correlation. States with more inclusive voting policies have greater levels of civic and greater levels of civ civic participation are healthier. So they, they plot this on 12 different outcomes. I encourage you to explore it. And that's because voting is a social determinant of health. Um, the American Medical Association declared it one in 2021 because elected officials prioritize the needs of voters. And this is something that I say a lot to people when they say they don't, that voting doesn't matter. I'll say elected officials give more attention and more resources to people that vote. So when you stay home, the power of your community goes down. 
And that's really important on the local level, the state level, and the federal level. And one last point for those of you who work in organizations, it also benefits benefits your, your organization and clients. So increasing civic engagement and voting participation makes elected officials feel more accountable. They are more accountable to voters and it can bring more attention to your clients, to your organization, to your mission and their struggles. So there's lots of reasons for us to be engaging voters. And the most important one is because fixing anything, all of the things that we, wa we want to accomplish as social workers starts by shifting power to those who are most impacted. And what we know is that these barriers to voting that we've been talking about, they feed and fuel these engagement barriers. More like You're more likely to hear, I don't vote because nothing changes. I hate politics. My vote doesn't matter. The system is rigged and I don't like the candidates. And those are fueled. We call that intentional disengagement. So these structural barriers on voting being complicated, inequities in civic learning, one party and people feeling like their vote doesn't matter, all of that fuels these, these systemic barriers. And, and just a note on felony disenfranchisement, know the rules in your state. We've got great resources on our website, but we don't wanna be suppressing the political power of, of um, voters with special circumstances, including former um, formerly incarcerated. I'm not gonna read these, we'll send them out, but I think it's really important for you to remember that what looks like apathy is not. Oftentimes, voters have never been asked to vote. They may not have ever been given the tools to vote. Many of us don't want to admit it, but when we say we voted, we talk about the president, but we don't think about all the other elections that are that have an enormous impact on our lives. And so what looks like apathy is really needs to start with a conversation as YT was talking about. Voting is about relationships. And, and just another, we know students also face an uphill battle to voting because of the lack of outreach and information. So um, again, just don't make the assumption. So I want to um, spend my last couple of minutes talking about um, how you can integrate this into your education and your practice. So first, go to votingasocialwork.org. We've got new resources, um, tools for democracy, why voting matters. We have a new video that was funded by the Scholar Strategy Network. We're about to launch another one um, on voting as a social work intervention that will go up on Monday in time for National Voter, um, Voter Registration Day. But you can get yourself ready to vote and make sure that you are an informed voter. You can find tools and resources for the flyers and things you can share and resources for schools and organizations. So it's all there and I encourage you to go look at it. So my first strategy is get yourself vote ready. If you are uncomfortable with the process, make sure that you are registered. It takes less than 30 seconds. It takes two minutes to register to vote if you're not vote. Know how you're gonna vote. Research the candidates. I'm, information and lack of information is rampant in terms of, you know, especially on local, we can Google we can Google presidents and certainly members of Congress, but finding really good resources to research the candidates and nonpartisan guides, that takes some investigation. So if you do your homework, you're going to feel more confident in um, knowing how to help others to vote. So start with yourself. Secondly, if you are a faculty member, what we know is that why is really important, understanding how this connects to social work practice and then giving students the opportunity to practice. Engaging in democracy is a practice sport. We don't learn it from a webinar. We learn it by doing it. So we've got some tools for that. Um, and we encourage all of you to think about how you create a culture of civic awareness, whether it's in your school, whether it's in your organization, or whether it's in your community. You can share information, when, where, and how to vote. You'd never have to get into the, into the conversation unless you're on your own time. If you're a social worker, you need to be nonpartisan and really make sure you're giving people the when, where, and how to vote. Um, and the encouragement, that is so important, the encouragement that their vote matters. And then on your own time, we can be as partisan or as we can organize. I work on campaigns in my, my free time. So, you know, there's just a distinction a little bit that I wanna make sure we're all thinking about. And then if you're a student and you're doing an educational contract coming up in the next couple of months, you can include voter activities on your website. Students are actually bringing these conversations to their practicums and changing social work practice. So you can find this form, organizations, you can analyze your, 
your practicum or your organization, we've got a guide for, um, for you that can help you identify strategies that to support the political power of your clients, your communities, and your schools. So get started, take the first step. And lastly, give students and all, you know, engage in political social work. It is intimidating, politics feels intimidating, but what you will learn is that people work for you. And actually the more you engage, you realize, huh, I might be, I, I know more than this person. Social workers understand policy. We understand how this impacts our clients. So I encourage all of you to get involved. Thank you. And um, my email's on here. Feel free to email me um, with questions about the website or these materials. Thank you very much, Tanya. A very rich presentation uh, with lots of detail for social workers and engagement. Um, this is a really this is really wonderful information coming from all of our speakers. Well, I'm I'm pleased to turn next to Otto Brown. He's a colleague on my own campus. He's uh, the civic engagement manager at the Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement at Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, providing lots of energy on our campus for voting. Uh, I saw, actually, I saw a memo from the provost today uh, supporting uh, Otto's work and the work he's doing moving up toward the, the coming election. So uh, turn it over to Otto. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Michael. And thanks for uh, reading that message this morning out from the provost. Really appreciate that too. Um, I also want to just say thanks uh, for the opportunity to join the panel this afternoon. Um, I you know, there are 54 days before the election and there's a lot of work that can be done and really excited to just think about how we can work together and share some strategies. Um, I also wanna say thanks for Michael, for your remarks about Dr. Gina McClendon. Um, when I was a student here at Wash U, whenever we did voter engagement work, we always said, what would Gina McClendon do? And, and we need to touch base with her and we need to talk about her. Um, and she was on the board of the League of Women Voters of Metro St. Louis, where I'm now a board member and folks talk about her all the time. So really just humbled and honored to be um, honoring her today and honoring the legacy of her work. As Michael mentioned, I'm Otto Brown. I'm a civic engagement manager at the Gephardt Institute. And I just wanna provide a little bit of framing about the Institute and the work that we do here. So our mission is student centric and we work to create a vibrant culture of civic engagement across Washington University's campus so that students can learn participate in and have an impact on civic life throughout their lives. So we're teaching students about the skills that they need here in college, giving them the opportunity to apply those and then making sure that they can take those beyond graduation and stay civically engaged for the rest of their lives. Our work is divided into three pillars that you can see up here, engage St. Louis, engage democracy and lead change. And all of these are action words. Um, and that's in part because we're an action tank, not a think tank. And our uh, founder, Congressman Dick Gephardt wanted to make sure that students were able to apply these things and not just think about them in, in theory, but see what they do in practice. Um, for the purposes of today, I'm going to share some of our strategies for voter engagement, and those, you know, are housed mainly in the engaged democracy pillar, but they cross over because, as we've heard, you know, from our other speakers today, this is a really important thing to be thinking about at the local level and to understand the local context as well. So as we think about voter engagement here at WashU, this is our arc of voter engagement. So we think about students voting and many undergraduates who come to us for the first time arriving on campus and then later in that fall semester, casting an informed vote. And there are lots of steps along the way to ensure that they're educated and informed voters. And we do everything in a nonpartisan way. Really wanna emphasize the nonpartisanship of our work. And even though it says students here on the screen, you can swap out citizen, you can swap in, swap out students for citizens and the same things apply. Making sure that you go through the voter registration process, understand what's on the ballot, um, what's at stake, what the candidates believe um, through voter education, and then actually showing up on election day and casting your vote. And what we do to ensure that this message gets across is we utilize strategic communications like what Michael was talking about this morning from our provost to all of our faculty.
faculty, um, as well as peer to peer initiatives, all campus emails, door knocking campaigns on our residential campus here. Um, and then also the storytelling piece. It's nice to inform people about the mechanics of voting and when the registration deadline is, but we have to add some meat to the bones and say, this is why you should be engaging in this. This is why you should care. This is how you should apply what you're passionate about through your social work program or through the, the practice that you do. And this is why it's important for you and those with whom you're working. And then the final piece here is thinking about emergent issues and student support. So, you know, everyone talks about an October surprise when we talk about presidential elections. I'd argue that we've had two October surprises and we're just creeping up on mid-September. So thinking about how we're supporting students and supporting those with whom we work who are navigating how to respond and how to kind of react to these different emergent issues and providing support. So what are strategies to bring yourself out of the 24 hour news cycle and to think about, you know, what matters and how can I make sure that I'm maintaining my sanity and human connection throughout all of these um, electoral pieces. I also wanted to share, this is another um, graphic that we use that really connects the idea of strengthening democracy with mutually beneficial partnerships. So, you know, this is how we view civic and community engagement connecting. So we design our programs here at the Gephardt Institute to really interlink these two things because we believe that democracy is stronger when students understand community context and our communities are stronger when students are engaging in civic life. So that means utilizing the places where you are on university campuses, um, or if you're not associated with the university, thinking about your local community and how you're engaging with it, understanding what matters to you and to your neighbors and having conversations really makes it so that our democracy is stronger. I also want to highlight the idea of mutually beneficial partnerships, and that really focuses on ethical community engagement where people are understanding the needs of the community in which they're working and working to address them in the most positive and least harmful way possible. Um, this assumption and this kind of graphic that connects experiential learning and engaged citizenship is really essential to our work at the university here at WashU, but it also applies more broadly. So whether you have the opportunity to work with students or working with different folks in the community, wanting to make sure that this is at the forefront of these different, um, of your work. And I know that we were talking about one to three ways to get involved and I have one to two slides on how to get involved. So really just a sampling of different ways for civic action that are both voting related and non-voting related. One of the things that we always like to say is that every year is an election year. So there are lots of things at the local level, as YT was talking about earlier, that might not happen on November 5th of this year, but happen in the spring of 2025, when folks might not be as tuned in because the media attention isn't as, as great, but that these things are really important. So this is just a sampling of, of opportunities to get involved that are voting related. I really wanna highlight working the polls. I was a poll worker in St. Louis County. It's a fantastic experience. It's a way for you to work with other people who are committed to the democratic process and who believe in elections. And you get to sit shoulder to shoulder with someone who might be of a different party than you. And you get to sit there together and ensure that students community members, people from all around your, your community have the opportunity to vote. You can also canvas about important issues, support election protection efforts, and do a lot of other text and phone banking things that you can do um, from home. And in a non-voting sense, attending public meetings. I mean, these are great opportunities to hear directly from elected officials, submitting public comments at the local, state, and federal level, joining a civic organization and maybe even its board, reading local papers to know what's going on in your community and getting to know your neighbors. 
really thinking about stronger communities and stronger democracy going hand in hand. And the final thing that I'll just mention here is we're 54 days away. Sorry to put a number on it, but it's the election is coming up fast. So make sure that you're registered to vote. Students move relatively often. Um, so making sure that you've updated your registration if you've moved. And if you're registered and you still live the same spot, it doesn't hurt to check your voter registration. Um, one important piece too is making a voting plan. This ensures that you really think through all of the different tactics that are important for election day. So how are you gonna vote? When, put it on your calendar. Invite your friends to come and vote with you. Know where your polling place is once that information is available and write it down in a way and schedule it so that you're you know, committed to it and the day doesn't pass with election day going by. Um, and for those of us who are here on campus, visiting vote.washu.edu for more information, obviously a publicly accessible website, lots of great resources and kind of our one-stop shop for voter engagement. Thanks for your time this afternoon. And with that, I'll toss it back to Michael. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Otto. That was uh, that was a really excellent, detailed uh, presentation. Our our listeners uh, and participants here are getting lots of specific suggestions, which I think is really really wonderful for, uh, especially for we're now in uh, not not that far away from a really important election in the United States, and there's opportunities to engage. Um, I think Lisa Johnson has been tracking the uh, the chat box and. Uh, and and picking out, we, we don't have very much time, but we have a, a little time for question and answer, and we'll, we'll work as a whole panel here. Lisa, do you have, uh, have you selected two or three uh, key questions here that are coming from uh, participants? Yes, I think um, there's been a couple of questions about how you facilitate a conversation. Some is just, how do you facilitate a conversation when people say they don't want to cast their vote? And Tanya really addressed some of that in her in her remarks, um, as would well that did others, but uh, related to that um, uh, was one that asking about how to allow students to feel safe to speak in to their diverse opinions in the classroom. So, if anyone would like to take that, how do you, how do you how do you manage a safe conversation? Yeah, Tanya. Uh, Tanya. You're on mute, Tanya. Thank you. Um, so I really encourage, and I know this um, sounds like an easy answer, but you know, social workers can't choose their clients. And it's always been essential that we listen. And, and I was just speaking with a class today who we started talking about politics. And you know, I, I encouraged all of them to ask more questions than they do arguing, because asking people questions about why they believe what they believe and why how they came to that opinion is far more effective than arguing with facts. We're never going to convince people with facts and numbers and, and shoulds and all of that stuff. But I think asking questions is probably the core. It's the core of social work practice, and it is it is essential in engaging with people who think differently than us and fostering conversation and dialogue. Thank you, Tanya. That a uh, very, very wise comment. I think um, probably all of us feel that uh, the information age and especially social media has has uh, sharpened sharpened uh, conversations in a way that's just edgy and 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 confrontive more than uh, more than di discursive. So, uh, and I think we can we can use a lot more just asking questions and understanding as as a whole society. Uh, Lisa, another question. Um, there have been a couple of remarks that I encourage folks to look at in the chat. One of them is someone who's participating from Kenya, um, who was really wondering whether this was relevant and important, and finding that uh, in Africa this is, of course, very important. Um, and you know, and and speaking then more to the local population, uh, or in, in, at least in this country, one question is um, asking about political engagement of social workers. Does it vary by state? Um, and are there any insights we can gain from these kinds of differences? Does someone want to pick that up? 
state differences in getting in, in engaged in voting? Tanya, did you want to? Sorry, I'm happy to talk about it. I, I think what we've seen is that when social workers get a chance, um, you know, in Connecticut, oh, YT, why don't you take this? Oh, no, Tanya, please finish your thought. Oh, well, what I was going to say is that we know that when we when we give students the practice to engage with democracy, it changes their practice. So I really think that that's the key is giving students the opportunity to operationalize our code of ethics to touch to do that transformative work of just starting by engaging people to vote, start by calling an elected official. Like I think that is, and, and state by state, that's where we see a difference. Um, I, I I think that it depends, schools play a big role in changing practice. Yeah, and I certainly, yeah, thank you, Michael. I certainly agree with that. The thing that I would add to that statement is that yes, me serving uh, on the National Association of Social Workers Board, I noticed that engagement looks a little different across other states, but it doesn't have to, y'all. The real reality is you can text, you have friends across this country, not just in your city, not just at your school. You can say, hey, I want to join a text bank for one of the nonpartisan groups, so your legal women voters, common cause, any of the groups that you are already volunteering or compassionate about to to then engage and remind other people on the value to vote. The other thing I'll say is storytelling is imperative, y'all. You do this all the time when you're talking to a client or if you're interning, right, around a certain matter, a certain issue. And so you use the same thing, even though we have a variation of what the things that we care about, our values, or our interests, a story will resonate with someone. Everybody has lost a loved one. Everybody has aspirations to thrive. So utilize that or your lived experiences uh, as a way to influence and impact people, the, un the understanding of their vote, right? And why it shouldn't just stop at you voting. You should be ongoing voting. And I know we only talk about this in big groups every four years, but every year is an election year. You do not have to start being civically engaged this year. You can do it now. Um, you know, Michael read my bio and it talked about me being a city councilwoman. Well, I got elected at 26. I got elected because majority of the population in my city was trending younger, 13 to 35, but nobody on that council was. And so if you want to ensure that people's voices are heard, then they need to have somebody that looks like them, that resonates with them in order for them to turn out. So don't just vote. Don't just call your friends. Run for office in a nonpartisan way. And that is what I'm, I'm conveying here today. So hopefully that answered the question. Very yeah, helpful. There, there Thank you, White. There were some questions in the chat about that as well. And um, the last one, I know we're running, we got about two minutes left. And one I just wanted to share in here, it says that a meeting with a California Assembly Committee said that social work clients who are children, frail, elderly, differently abled, unhoused, and undocumented don't vote. So it isn't necessary to listen to social workers. How would you all respond to that assembly? <laughs> Go ahead, Tanya. <laughs> Put a thumbs, thumbs down on that. Um, <laughs> well, it's our job. It's our job to work with our clients and um, and in, in, engage in the democratic process. So uh, whether that, that observation is right or wrong, we, we always have work to do in this area. And I very much like the, the idea that Tanya framed as 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 voting and and democratic participation being a social work intervention, uh, we we have a lot more uh, work to do to develop that e even more in the future. But I really think that's very constructive. Let me close by uh, th thanking all of the panelists for really rich presentations today. Lots of detail. Uh, if you have additional questions, please do get back to the panelists or to any of us, and we will try to connect you with uh, uh, people to answer your questions. Uh, and, and above all, uh, we, you know, it's an important, it's an important transition, uh, in, uh, a turning point or uh, in, a, in America right now, whether we go one way or the other uh, for democracy. And I will be very frank ab about that. Uh, you, whatever your views are, uh, it's important that you, you work and, and uh, are engaged as a citizen and as a professional social worker and maybe also as a, 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 an academic uh, in a university in, in working with this process. Uh, working where you can or 
if you're able to uh, work in a swing state, either either remotely or 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 if you are able to go there and knock on doors and work with with that process, I think we should consider that. Lots of good suggestions from Mimi and YT and Tanya and Otto about how to how to be engaged. So whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or belong to some other party, uh, it's a good time to to engage in this process uh, and 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 reach out. I, I would just I would just close with the idea that. Voting, we tend to take it sort of for granted and we, you know, on voting day, we get up and try to get there before we go to work or, you know, however we're able to work it out. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it would be hard to overstate the importance of voting as really the bedrock mechanism of democracy. Ultimately, if people are able to vote and express their view, then problems can be addressed and solved. If people are not able to do that, and if, I mean, all people, so they represent the whole society, then, then we work, we, we, we end up living and working in places that are not as effective as, as, as they could be. Uh, so democracies, democracies, we know this from empirical evidence, democracies are good for people, they're good for society, and they're good for the world. So as social workers, we have a, a, a large contribution to make, uh, to, to help ensure that democracy continues. And, uh, and I, think, I think social work will only grow in its engagement in democracy. And I think that will be a really good, uh, a really good future. So thank you all very much. I, I'm really grateful to all the, the, the speakers at the, at, the mechan at the presentation today. Really, really rich session. And uh, best wishes to all of you out there listening for uh, a good election season and a good outcome, uh, however, you, uh, however you are framing that. Thank you very much.